So here we have a question of um, chi-square testing of independence. Here's some information. The YouGov voting intention poll for the end of March 2023 delivers the following table of results to the question, how well or badly do you think the government are doing at handling Britain's exit from the European Union? And what you see here is answers to this question and respondents could answer one of three, could give one of three answers. They could either say, well, government is treating the exit well or badly or I don't know. And we know that answers come which region the respondent comes from, the north of England, the Midlands, London, rest of the south of England, Wales or Scotland. Okay, so it's any of the parts of Great Britain. Okay, and London and, and England should split up into, into more regions. Perhaps I should clear that here. All of these, for those which are not from England, all of these are regions of England. So the question now here is test whether the variables, how well someone thinks that the government's dealing with Brexit and which region they are from. So we'll call that that one here the R variable and this one the B variable, whether these two are independent. And when we perform such hypothesis tests, the null hypothesis will always be that the two B and R are independent. And the alternative will be that B and R are actually dependent. This will always be the setup of the hypothesis. As usual, when we are calculating hypothesis tests, we perform calculations under the null hypothesis. And one reason why we have to set up the hypothesis in this way is that the null hypothesis of independence gives us very clear instructions, which we will be using in the calculation of the test statistic. So, so with every test, you know you need a test statistic and you need a distribution for that test statistic. The test statistic we're using here is what is called a chi-squared test statistic. Let me call it c-squared. And that is calculated as follows. It is the sum of some terms. Okay, so let me just say, put a sum here, and then we are summing up terms, which looks like this. E i j minus o i j squared divided by e i j. So, what are e i j and o i j, and what are we summing over? So, let me explain the o i j's first. The o i j's are basically exactly what we have in this table. O i j's is the observed number of respondents which fall into a particular category okay so that's better i'll take that yellow marking away here so the observed values for instance that's how many people responded that the government is handling brexit well and come from london in our case here that is 48. Okay, so we have 48 such observations. And we have observations like that. For all, how many categories do we have here? Three times six. For all 18 categories, we have such values. So that i and j is an in index that basically loops through the three rows. Let's call that the i index. So i is equal, goes from one to three and over j columns so j in our case goes from one all the way to six and that gives us 18 different categories so what are we summing over all categories 
So that is the OI chain. Now what we also need is the EI chain. Right? This value here, EI chain, we need that here and here. And that is the number of observations we would expect, for instance, to, to answer well, government is handling Brexit well and coming from London. So that number here, so we're needing a second number here that we would expect if the two variables B and R were independent. So what you need to know is how to calculate this value. Now here I just show you a little trick, a little shortcut. What we'll do, and we will do the work in Excel, we will calculate total numbers. Okay, total numbers on both margins. So we will add up all of these numbers in the first row. And that will give us all respondents that answered that the uh, government is handling Brexit well. Okay, so let's call that actually N, it's the first row, one dot, okay, or any columns. And we can do the same and we can calculate N two dot and N three dot. But then we can also calculate, for instance, all the respondents which come from the north. That will be n dot one. So any row, column one, and n dot two, n dot three, n dot four, n dot five, and n dot six. Okay, and then we can of course also sum up all respondents. That will be n our sample size. Now, how you calculate, for instance, the expected value that someone answered well and comes from London. So that value here, which we, which we want. We could also think about that as E, that is the first row, so, and the third column, so E13 is that we take that number, that number, and we divide by that number. So in general, so here it will be n one dot times n dot three divided by n, or in general, four e i j it will be calculated as n i dot times n dot j divided by n. This is how we calculate that expected value. And that's the value we would expect if the two variables were independent. And then what this test statistic does is it basically compares. Right? At the core of this test statistic is this value here, e i j minus OIJ, the difference between what we got and what we expect under independence. And if these differences are large, the whole test statistic will be large. And then we will reject the null hypothesis. Because if the null hypothesis was true, then we would expect these differences to be fairly small. So what is large and what is small? Of course, we need to know how is this test statistic distributed. And it turns out to be distributed as what we call a chi-square distribution. So this is now the sort of Greek chi squared. And that has degrees of freedom, very much like a t-distribution, which has different degrees of freedom. And that is calculated as the number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one. So in our case, we have three rows, so that is two times, we have six columns, so six minus one is five, two times five, so that is 10. So in our case, that test statistic, if the null was true, is chi-square distributed with 10 degrees of freedom. So 
So you can see that would be, we said there are 18 of these categories. So we need to make this calculation here 18 times because we're getting 18 different expected values. Then we need to do this calculation here 18 times and then sum that number up. This is way too messy to not use Excel. So let's move over to Excel and do these calculations. So here's an Excel spreadsheet, which I prepared with the numbers. And I already calculated these sums. Okay, we had all together 433, 34 respondents answering the government dealt well with Brexit, 1,336 saying they dealt badly with Brexit and 231 which said, we don't know. And for instance, we had 242 coming from London. So what we want to calculate is we basically need a table like this with exactly the same structure, but not with the observed values, not the OIJs, but we want EIJs. So I'll just copy that table. And uh, so let's get rid of all of the values. So let's start with that one value, the London value, which we wanted to calculate the well, government's dealing well with it and coming from London. We said the way how we calculate that is we take that value, the total well number times the total London number divided by the overall number of observations. So in this case, you see we had 48 respondents, which did come from London and said the government's dealing well with Brexit. But if the two random variables B and R were independent, we would expect 52 and a half approximately. So now we just need to repeat this calculation for all of the other categories. So what happens if we copy that cell? Ah, there is a problem. So let's highlight this and see why there is a problem. Ah, you see the blue and the purple uh, colored references, they move to the right when really we didn't want them to move to the right. We wanted them to stick with the 434 and the 2001. So of course, how we do that in Excel, we go back to our original cell double click so we see the references again 434 that was h we didn't want to move away from column h so we put a dollar in front of the column and then h6 that 2001 that was the h6 again we didn't want to move away oh, sorry from column h so we put a dollar in front so let's say enter let's see whether that would work we copy to the right. Oh, yes, that gives a number that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay, so let's double click on one of them. We want to check whether it's correct. Oh, yes. Okay, so the expected value here for Midlands and well is the product of Midlands total times well total divided by the sample size. That's great. So what about if we copy that cell down? Again, we are having a problem. So let's double click in here. Ah, now it was the purple and the red cell, which moved the cell down as we copied down, but we wanted it to stay on row six. So let's go back to that London cell. So perhaps we also need to, for now, we'll delete those because we need to change something again. So the red and the purple, we want to fix the row to six. So we go to the red cell, we fix the row, the purple cell, we fix the row by putting a dollar in front. Okay, so let's copy down. Ah, that seems to work. Okay, and then can we copy it to the right? That still seems to work. Quick check. That looks okay. Quick check. That looks okay. So what we can really do now is we can just copy these cells just across the entire table. So here we calculate the entire table, do a quick check whether we're actually calculating what we want and that looks all good. So these are now the EIJs. What do we need to do now? Let's go back here. We calculated the EIJs and the OIJs. We have them. Now we need to calculate EIJ minus OIJ squared divided by EIJ. 
So let's go back to the spreadsheet. I'll just copy the structure of the table again. Okay, delete all the values here. And let's go into that first cell and say here we want to calculate EIJ. Oh, we started, I think, with OIJ. It doesn't matter because we are squaring minus EIJ squared divided by EIJ in EIJ is here. Enter. So let's see. That looks OK. And then we can copy that. Let's do a check. Is it using the right values? Yes, it is using the right values. That means we can copy all of that down. Still using the right values. Excellent. So what we have done now is we calculated this purple term here for all our 18 possible outcomes. And now we need to sum it up. That's the easiest of all tasks. We use sum and just highlight all our 18 cells. We get 32.4755. So in our case, the test statistic is 32. 4755. So the last bit we need to do is we need to decide, well, that value here, so we get differences between EIJ and OIJs. Now you can compare them. We'll get differences. In our original case, that was sort of London. Let me highlight a few pairs. London, we had 48 observed and 52 and a half expected. Let's say Wales badly. I'll do that in a different color here. So Wales badly, we had 67 observed and basically we expected 67 if the two variables were independent. And let's use another case here. Um, badly the north. So here we had 337 observed and 321 expected. So you can see there are differences, but are they really big enough for us to reject the null hypothesis? These values here, the EIJ values, were the values we expected if they, the two variables were independent. These are the ones we observed. Are the differences big enough for us to reject the null hypothesis? That is, to answer that question, we need the distribution of the test statistic under the null hypothesis. And that's the chi-square distribution with 10 degrees of freedom. Now, chi-square distributions, let me sketch one here. They only take positive values. So if we have zero here, the chi-square distribution will look perhaps something, something like this. Okay, that is the distribution for the test statistic. Now, our test statistic is now, let me just sketch a value here, 32 point, let's say 32.5. Chi-square tests will always be right-tailed tests because any sort of difference will contribute to the test statistic becoming bigger. So if you're having a right-tailed test, the p-value of that test is going to be the size of the tail in that distribution. So our question is, how big is that tail? And that will be the p-value. And once we have the p-value, we can decide whether it's smaller than a significance level. Again, we haven't been given any significance level. So let's say we use an alpha of 1%. So how do we get that p-value? You can either use a distribution table with 10 degrees of freedom or as we're anyway working in Excel we can go back to Excel and we can calculate the p-value here. The function is we are using is the chi-square distribution. It needs our value that's the 32. It needs the degrees of freedom that is 10. Do we want a value from the cumulative distribution? Yes so we say true. So what we get is 
966. So almost one, but remember what we do get is that value here in on that side of the distribution. So that is 0 0.999666. That means that the p-value in our case is 0 0.0003. Uh, that's the p-value of 0.034, three zeros. So that's a very small p-value. And therefore, we decide on this occasion to reject h naught. Rejecting h naught means we decide that the two random variables, how people think about how the government dealt with Brexit and the region are in are not independent. We reject that null hypothesis. They are dependent. So how people think the government has done with Brexit depends on where you come from in Great Britain.